Do your Loras look like they should be main actors in Borat movies? Something like this? Well, maybe it is your face, but probably it's just bad technique. Unless it is your face, in which case I would suggest just standing behind someone who looks better than you. Let's get started here. So first, I want to talk about the big elephant in the room. There is no simple one-click solution to get a perfect Laura. Creating a really nice Laura for your purposes depends on what you expect as a result, how you want to use the Laura, and what kind of artistic style you want to use the Laura in. Because of course, it's going to be different from someone who creates an anime Laura. So there is also no perfect recipe to get the result. And that of course means that best results need testing. Not just for the Laura, but also what goes into the Laura and afterwards what you do with the Laura. And that means you want to test with the photos you're taking. You want to test with the words you apply to these photos in the clip descriptions. You want to see what kind of models you use for the LoRa training. And afterwards, you want to see what kind of LoRa weight you're using, but also what kind of prompts and negative prompts you want to use to get the best results. I know all of that sounds a little bit complex, but believe me, it is a lot of fun. And once you figure it out, it's very easy to do. And I know some of you are gonna say, hey, this guy actually wants us to do complex stuff, not just click a button. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. If you want to have really good stuff, it's a little bit of an effort to get there. But don't worry, I will help you most of the way there. So the first thing we need, of course, to train a Laura is the images as an input. Now, one thing I found through testing, but also talking with other people online is that you don't want to have too many extreme expressions of the face in your LoRa images that you use for the training, because this is going to confuse stable diffusion and the AI on what you actually want, but also what the face actually looks like. So you want to have a rather stable face that either is neutral or has a bit of a smile or a bit of an expression in it, but not too much. A smile is good if it also has the teeth in it, because then the AI can also learn what your teeth look like on top of just what your smile look like, but nothing that covers the face or is too extreme or has strange angles. It is really important also to understand the limitations of what an AI can do. It needs to understand which of the parts of the image are part of your face and not part of your face. So in the best case, you want to have nothing on the face to begin with, because then the Laura can really understand the finer details of your face. Another thing that stable diffusion is really not good at is different extreme angles of the face. For example, the face looking upwards to the sky, looking downwards to the ground, a face that is on an angle sidewards is really difficult for the AI to understand. It will often not get a good result, but at the same time, it will also diminish the quality of the face. Another thing you want to avoid is images that are too noisy or overexposed, because this is also something that the LoRa is going to learn in the process. And when you have also noisy images, there is no finer detail that the AI can pick up on. For example, in this case, you can't even see the eyelashes. So how is the AI expected to learn these details? This also means don't use blurry images, no low resolution images, no images with compression artifacts, which are these little squares in there or other defects in the image. This will give the AI the wrong impression and you will have a worse result from that. Another thing that might be important here is oily or reflective skin. This, of course, is especially important in the summer where the skin sweats. So you want to get some skin powder to have it more matte so there's no reflection on your skin because afterwards this might be burned into the LoRa and you might have a hard time removing that from your AI output. Now here you can see some examples of the images I have taken. With a little bit of a smile, 
And then with a bit of a smile, we can also see the teeth, different face expressions, but all of them are very subtle. At the same time, we have a very even light. We have a little bit of reflection on the skin, but overall, this is a very neutral picture that the AI can pick up on. But still two things stick out here from that image. There's a little bit of sweat on the skin because we didn't have skin powder to make it non-reflective. But also there's a little bit of eye bags down here. Now, one thing you want to tell your model before you take the photo is don't be sleepy, don't be overworked, have a refreshed face because this is something you cannot really get rid of in that moment unless maybe you have a specialist for makeup there. In this case, this might just be something that is part of the face and then that is completely okay. But if it's not part of the face, you just want to try to avoid that because again, these subtle details are going to be learned by the AI and you don't want to have images afterwards where the person looks tired or exhausted in all of your AI images. Now another thing you want to do here is to crop the face out. This is another advice from my friend Yuri. Thank you very much for that. So when you have the bigger picture, this is good so the AI can learn the face in relation to the body, but then cropping it out also in a square format is good so that the AI can focus just on what the face looks like. This of course afterwards can also help you when you're going to do face in painting, for example, with a detailer. Another thing you want to do here is to have the person in different sizes so that you have the upper body, then most of the body and then the complete body so that the AI can also see the head in relation to the body, but also what the body shape looks like so that afterwards when you're going to render the image, the person is not just looking from the face like the person, but also from the rest of the body. There is some likeness to that. After several test rounds, I trained 10 different LoRa's on this specific face, I came up with this selection of images. So you can see most of them now are close ups. There is very little rotation. Actually, there's just one photo where she's looking up a little bit, but only in a slight angle. And then we have some other images with different clothing where she's standing a little bit further from the camera. So we can also see the body and a little bit of the body dynamic. Of course, one element for this is better gear. If you have a really good camera, for example, I'm using a Sony a7 III and also a Sigma 1.4 DGDN 85 millimeter lens. Now this is pretty good professional equipment, which is going to be in the thousands of dollars. And if you can't afford that, you could, for example, go to a photo store and say, can I take some test photos and then snap, 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 simply make the photos of your model or maybe you have a friend who can borrow you or who can come to the place to make the photos for you with this really good equipment because with a lens like this you get really really sharp details on the face and that can very much improve your results on the LoRa training. Of course if you don't have any of that here is a suggestion for minimal gear at least get you a couple of reflector discs. These are pretty big ones and that is good because it gives you more of a reflection surface and that means softer light on your model. So this can really help you and is very, very affordable and you can then still take the photos with your smartphone. Now let's talk for a second about the conditions of when to actually take these photos. I would suggest to you to photograph on a sunny day, but stand in the shadow so you don't have that really harsh light on the face of the person. Now, a second choice here would be an overcast day, which means you have a cloudy sky, in which case you have a natural soft light that doesn't create harsh shadows. But of course, you still want to look for a day where it is overcast, but still bright enough so that you can take sharp photos on that day. And of course, another choice here is to go out on a sunny day, but then use one of these reflectors. One of them, as you can see here, is white, which means the light is shining through it. It doesn't actually reflect it. You can also use it as reflection, but this can be used as a giant softbox. So in that case, what you want to do is to have a second person hold that really big disc 
opposite to the person that you're taking a photo of so that the sunlight is softened through that reflector onto the face of your model. In which case, again, you get a really nice soft light with no harsh shadows in there. Of course, there's also the question of adjusting the images. And I would suggest you to use Lightroom because this is by far the best software to easily adjust the images. But of course, if you're a little peasant who lives in your mama's basement, you want to look for Snapseed. <laughs> which is a free app from Google and it's also very good at adjusting these images. Now this is an app on your phone which might be perfect if you take the photos on your phone in the first place. Also check out if your phone camera can do raw photos because then you have a bigger range of how you can adjust these images. So let's have a little bit of a look on what you actually want to adjust in these images. Now highlights are always a good idea because if you have a little bit of overexposure in there or some skin reflection or other highlights you want to bring them down a little bit. For the shadows you often have darker areas you want to have some medium look in there. So the bright areas not too bright the dark areas not too dark so push the shadows up a little bit. Afterwards, of course, the white balance. So if your character has a gray shirt or a white shirt on, you can tap on that shirt with your white balance to actually get the real colors from that photo situation. Clarity can help you improve the image, but use it very softly. So this can bring out a bit more of the details. If you push it too hard, the image will look very harsh. So only a little bit of clarity. And then also sharpness applied a little bit to improve the sharpness. Sharpness is not meant to make blurry images look sharp. It is meant to make sharp images more detailed. So also apply that just a little bit. And of course, last but not least, a very important question is here. What model do you want to choose for your training? If you want to go for photorealistic images like portraits, raw photos, stuff like that as an output of your AI, you might want to look into Photon. I have a video about that here that shows you the usage of this model. It's really great, but it's also very good for LoRa training. If you want to be more purist about it, you might want to use the Stable Diffusion 1.5 base model. Look at that on the internet. I will also link it below my video. This is a 7.5 gigabyte model, but it's very nice for training. And of course, you can also look into realistic vision, which is a little bit harder to prompt for and reliberate, which is from the same people who made the deliberate model. So this is a little bit more artistic and easier to prompt for. So experiment with these models or other models of your choosing to see what kind of results you get. The keyword here being experiment and see what you get. So even if you get a nice result, there might be a better result out there. So train different LoRa's with different models with different settings and test them to see what you get. Let's go into actually doing it. So here I want to show you real quick in Lightroom Classic. We are in the developer section up here. I have an underexposed photo here because I exposed for the highlights. And as you can see, when we zoom in here, it's very nice and sharp, but it's just very dark at the same time. You can't even see the eyes. So what we're going to do here is on the right side here, you have exposure. So you can pull that up a little bit. But of course, you don't want to have things overexposed. So we can push down the highlights a little bit but you don't want the shadows to be too dark. So you can push up the shadows a bit. So you can see now we are arriving at a, the area where everything is kind of in the middle with the eye shadows, with the bright areas, everything is balanced out. Now what you can also do here is for example, to push up the clarity a little bit, just a bit to get more detail in here and then maybe also want to use dehaze a little bit so you get even nicer details in here. Another thing you can do up here is to reduce the white values a little bit so you don't have any areas in your image that are completely white. And what we can also see down here now is for example that we have very nice details here on the arms. We can look into the shadows here. We can see the details and the fabric of the clothing. So now after these changes we have an image with 
very quick adjustments that show all of the details we need for the training. After you have adjusted and selected all of the images you want to use, when you have, for example, Lightroom in the export, you want to set the max width and height to 1600, which is a pretty nice high resolution for training of the images. You can go even higher for the resolution, or if you have an older GPU, you might want to get lower with the resolution so that training is easier for your GPU and also faster. Now in the next step what we need to do here is that you want to put all of the exported images into a folder and then you want to navigate to that folder inside of Koya SS. You want to check out this video here on how to install Koya SS on your drive and here you can see I'm in the utilities tab and I'm in VD14 captioning, which is pretty nice for captioning. This is usually used for anime captioning, but I find that it generally works pretty well because it puts in a lot of interesting and very good words for the captioning of your image. So navigate to your folder with this yellow button here in the middle. When you have selected the button, click here on caption images. This might download a model for captioning the images first. So in the first time this process might be slower for you and then next time it should be pretty quick and every image will have its own text file in there. After you've done this, you want to use a tool that is called the Boru Dataset Tag Manager. This is a free tool. I will link it below the video. Here you can see all of the images you have selected and then all of the tags that have been created inside of the text file. You can also use here a preview that shows you a bigger view of the image, but I would highly advise you that you put this preview somewhere on the site where it doesn't matter too much because this software sometimes gives you a pop-up where you have to click on yes for saving the changes and that might be behind the preview image and if that happens you have to alt for the software because there is no way to get to that pop-up otherwise and that's a bit of a pain. Now inside of that software you have three different columns here. In the first one you have the image, in the second one you have the keywords that are for the selected image or the selected images and on the right side you have the list for all of the images together. So if you want to add or remove something for all of the images you want to do this with the tools here on the right. So if you want to add something you click on the plus and here in the pop-up you can also select if you want to have this on the top center down or custom so where the position of the tag is. Now if this tag is more important you want to put it on the top so it is at the beginning of the text file. If it's less important you can put it at the end which means down here in this case. Now one thing you want to add at the start of every image is the calling word for your LoRa. In this case I'm using the name of the model so that when you then write the prompt you can use the calling word but then also of course use the specific command for the LoRa with the LoRa weight in there. So I would suggest that you go through all of these images and you look at the different words and if they apply to the image, if not, you might want to remove them from the image. Now these words, they work like variables. So that means if you write a word, you can change that afterwards. If you don't write a word, you can't change that afterwards. So for example, I would highly suggest that if there is clothing in there, that you define the clothing, but also the color of the clothing so you're able to change that. Also with the hair, you want to define the hair cut and also the hair color. In this case, I have, for example, short hair, but then also black and gray hair in there. And of course, these words that you define here are a big part of your testing of training the LoRa. So if the LoRa doesn't work correctly, one part of that might be that your keywords are not good enough. So you want to change that, experiment with that, what works for you, what gives you the best results. Sometimes maybe bring in some additional description here that helps the AI to understand what you actually want to train. And when you're finished with that, you want to go in here, file, save all changes. 
Now for the number of images you want to use here, I think there is no specific number that works best. Whatever gives you the best result works for you. It might be only 15 images, but at other times it might be 45 images. Whatever gives you the most precise results is the number that you need for your training. So also experiment with that. Sometimes use more images, sometimes use less images. But of course, make sure that all of these images have their text file with the description inside of the text file. After that, the after that, the folder structure for a LoRa is as follows. First of all, you have your folder where you train the LoRa in and give it a descriptive name so that you define what kind of testing you're doing at that moment. For example, you can define the model that you're using for the training, the steps and epochs that you're using, then also the dimensions and the alpha that you're using and other kinds of settings that you want to note down here in the file name. And that is important because when you come back afterwards, you still want to understand how you did that testing. Now let's go into that folder and you can see here we have a simple structure. One folder is called images, the other log, and then we have a model folder. Now inside of the images folder, they are not the images. Inside there is another folder there. This folder starts with a number at the beginning, then an underscore, and then the name of the LoRa in here. Now the number defines the steps or repetition that you want to use for your LoRa. I mostly use 10 for my training, but other people also use just five repetitions. Really depends on the process and what gives you the best results. After all this is set up, you want to go into Koya SS again, and you want to use the Dream Booth LoRa tab up here. Now on the first tab, you have the source model. In this case, you want to decide what kind of model are you going to use. And for that, you have here this white icon. You want to click on that. And with that, you can actually navigate to the folder in Automatic 11.11, where you have all of your models. You don't need to copy them to any other place. And you want to select the model you want to use for this. For example, let's say in this case, we're going to use the Photon model. So now that we have this in here, we're going to click on the second tab. And here you define the image folder, the output folder, which is the model folder and the log folder. Again, click here on this yellow icon and then navigate to where your folder is. Now for the images folder, it's important that you do not select the folder with the number. You select the images folder here instead. Then you do the same thing for the model folder and you do the same thing for the log folder. It is super important that you set the model name because this is not just a file name. This is also how your LoRa is going to be called inside of automatic 1111 with the LoRa command. So in this case, let's call it Betka test 10. Now we go to the settings. In here are a lot of different adjustments and you might want to go into different Discord groups and ask people what works for them, what kind of adjustments they are using. But usually what I'm using in here is for the training batch size. That is how many images are going to be trained at the same time. I'm using between one and four. If your GPU is older, just go with one here. This trains one image at a time. The epochs here is how many LoRa's are going to be trained one after another as iterations. Now this is important because for example, one epoch with a thousand steps is not the same as 10 epochs with a hundred steps each, even though you have a thousand steps at the second example too, because every time an epoch is finished, this can then be used as a training example for the next epoch for improvements, which cannot happen if you only train one epoch. Save every nth epoch means if you want to save that LoRa from the testing, if you want to have 10 different LoRa's afterwards, one for each epoch, you can of course put here one. Now for mixed precision and safe precision, I would suggest you experiment here with the settings. I have seen some good results with BF16, but I more often have seen good results with FP16. So I usually leave both of them at FP16. Now you will see a lot of discussion online, for example, about the learning rate and the warm up steps that you want to use here. You can experiment with that. You can read into online discussions. 
usually I leave them as they are and get still pretty good results. What I found has more impact here. And again, thanks for Yuri for your advice on that is the network is the network rec is the network rank dimensions and the network alpha. If you set them higher, you get a much bigger lower file. If you set this here to 256 and this over here for network alpha to 128, you're gonna get a lower that is about 256 megabytes big. So it kind of seems like you get as many megabytes as you, as you set dimensions here, but you can also get much better results and a more consistent LoRa in the different prompts you're using it with. So again, experiment with this setting, what kind of value works best for you. Down here for the max resolution, I would highly advise you to set this to 768 by 768, unless your GPU is too slow to be able to render that, because I find that this gives you a much higher higher precision in the details of your output, but also more consistency when using the LoRa with different kinds of prompts. After that, we are pretty much set for training. Just click here on the training model button. And I would very much suggest that you look here in your command window on what kind of information you get here and if the rendering is actually starting. Now it takes a little bit of time to load in all of the information and prepare the LoRa training. But after that, you will see it go through the steps and it also will give you a time on how long it takes to train the LoRa. After the LoRa training is finished, in here you will find your LoRa files. Now, one of them has a very short name. This is the finished LoRa that has all of the epochs that you set as the max epochs. And then the other ones with the longer names, these are the in-between LoRa epochs. You can copy this over into the LoRa folder inside of Automatic 11.11. Now, at this point of our LoRa training, we are ready for the testing. So here the fun basically begins. Now, here are several things you want to look out for but also methods that will give you better results and give you a more precise understanding if your LoRa is actually good. Now, of course, one thing you want to do here is to test out different kind of scenes and you want to test out different kind of prompts in here that can also give you a good understanding how stable is your LoRa. Will the result look like the person in all of these different scenes or is the face changing every single time? In which case you means that your LoRa is not very stable. Now at that point of the process, what you also want to do is to compare the face in the finer details. So for example, what we can see here is in the original photos, the eyes are bending a little bit downwards in the middle. They are not completely straight. Another thing we have here is that the lips are rather thin. And specifically with this face, and this made it pretty difficult to train this LoRa, is that the features have a certain male aspect to them. It's a little bit of a harder face. Now, Stable Diffusion is mostly trained on very soft and very feminine faces. So if you have a face with a bit more defined edges to them, that could be a problem for the training and you need to be more precise and dive deeper into the process until you figure out the settings and the clip words and the method that works for you. So in this case, I'm also comparing the shape of the face, the size of the collarbones up here for the cheeks, the shape of the nose, and also especially this middle nose ridge here, which often sticks further down in the creations of LoRa's with the AI. So in this case, it doesn't stick down further. It's rather flat with the nostrils on the side. So you want to check for these little details. In this case, also we have thinner lips and Stable Diffusion loves to make bigger, fuller lips for women. So again, you want to look into that if that is here for the training. Now in this case, the lips are mostly there. They are a little bit too puffy, a little bit too big compared to the original lips, which are nice and big in the middle, but then very fast, go very thin on the sides and have rather pointy sides at the end. So 
there could be even more improvement to that but overall i think that the likeness is very good there and also the expression of the face the way the eyes look all of these smaller details are very much there now one thing you can see here and this is what i pointed out at the beginning is we have in my photos a little bit of sweat on the face and i might retouch that in the photos or we take the photos again so you can see in the results that now the AI has picked up on that and renders this into the images. So also here we have a little bit of sweat on the face in the AI rendered image. But overall, I have to say that I'm very happy with this result and this comes very close to how the person actually looks. Now here we have a result from an earlier LoRa and you can see right away it doesn't look at all like the person. It comes a little bit close, but Stable Diffusion had tremendous problems to recreate this specific face. It took some time to figure out how to do this right. Now, again, also here you can see that the AI is pretty much also picking up on these eye bags under the eyes, for example. In this case, it has nice thin lips, but the face shape at all doesn't match the output here we have another example and that kind of again it comes pretty close you could think maybe i would recognize that person if you don't know that person too well and this is why it is important to compare your ai images with the actual photos so that you see the finer details because a lot of what is in the original face is here in the ai face but it is always a little bit off so the best thing you can do to actually figure out how good your LoRa is is make a lot of different renders and compare it to the original face and see for the finer details are they there how precise are there does it actually match what the person really looks like now to get these good results so you're able to compare these things here are the settings i want to suggest for you in this case i'm using photon as a model for rendering and also using photon as a model for the lora training use restore face and then you want to use high res fix and in this case, we are using high-risk fix with the ultra sharp model, or maybe if you want to with another model, for example, for example, the RESR GAN 4X model. I'm going to upscale this by two. And because I'm using an upscaling model, I'm setting the denoise rather low in this case to 0.2. In this case, I also set the high-risk steps to 10. Now here is the part that is even more important than that. You want to scroll down here and you want to use a detailer for that. This is an extension for automatic 1111. You want to enable that and you want to put the LoRa also in here that you are testing. In the a detailer, you can set the weight of the LoRa higher than in the original prompt that you're using. Now, what this is doing is that it is first rendering a low resolution image up here with your settings then it is going to upscale the image to the higher resolution and then it is rendering the face into the image and in painting it with the higher resolution for that image and this is also why in this case we have a very nice and detailed face that also resembles the character pretty well because the face itself is rendered on a higher resolution and this gives you a good testing if the lower works if you only do the low resolution rendering without the upscaling through high res fix and without a detailer you might get a bad result even with a good LoRa so it's really important to go through these steps for your testing I would highly suggest to you also to turn the high res fix off and the a detailer off and set down here the batch count for example to 10 or 15 to render through a couple of low resolution images and then you want to copy over the seed of the images that work well for you. You will find that down here. Copy that over into a text file and then test out these specific seeds with the high res fix and with the A detailer to see how the face looks with these images that actually look like the images you want to have. Now, after each of these tests, after you've compared the output of the image to the actual photos that you have photographed, you want to go back to the drawing board, which means 
check again the selection of your pictures. Maybe you want to take some pictures out. Maybe you want to take some additional pictures because something is missing that could help with the precision. Look into the text files with the Boru dataset manager to check out the keywords that you're using here. Maybe you need to add some additional keywords. Maybe you need to take out some keywords that are confusing the AI. Then train again the model, maybe with different settings, maybe with another base model that you want to choose, like realistic vision, the reliberate, the photon model, or the stable diffusion model to see what kind of different results you get. Also, what you can do here is to train multiple LoRa's, but with different base models to compare them to each other to see what kind of results are you getting from that? Don't feel bad if this takes you a lot of different LoRa's. For my training for this specific model, I trained 10 different LoRa's and I talked with people online to give me tips, to give me feedbacks of what I can improve. So that is also a very important step for you. Check out different Discord rooms. For example, I have a Discord where I have a specific room for model and LoRa training. You can ask the people there, you can upload the images so they have a comparison between the photo and the end result to give you some tips and tricks on how to improve that process. Of course, always take these tips and advices with a grain of salt. So they might work for you, they might not work for you, but testing it out will improve the process. And over time, you will develop a training workflow that works specifically for you and the results you want to have. So every time you train Allura, this process is getting easier, faster and giving you much better results. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like that. And thanks for watching. Bye. Oh, you're still here. So uh, this is the end screen. There's other stuff you can watch like this or that's really cool. And yeah, I hope I see you soon. Uh, leave a like if you haven't yet. And well, um, yeah.